Hey, today's topic, exciting, data, science, and sculptures. What if I will tell you that data and sculptures are not that separated? The data is actually a material, just like paper. What if you can hear climate crisis and not only see it? How would you respond then? And why art is a way to understand science when data becomes meaningful? Today's guest, the artist Natalie Mibach, will answer all these questions and many more. We are being told to choose between the left and right brain, between studying art and engineering, between creative and analytical thinking. Our society tells us that art and business are not connected. But what if society is wrong? What if it misleading us? The good news is that understanding what art is can bring us to a new revelation. Art does matter in innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship. And with the help of this podcast and its guests, you as well will learn that art is not an object. Art is a mindset. You are listening to the Artian Podcast with me, Nir Hindi. Hey, podcast listeners. Thanks again for coming back. We are getting closer to the end of this season, the first season of the Artian Podcast. Honestly, I'm very, very grateful for all of you from around the world that actually taking the time to listen to the content that we are creating and these amazing people that working at the intersection of art, entrepreneurship, innovation, technology. We are excited to get you, our listeners, on our podcast. We would love to hear from you. If you have any question about the intersection of art, innovation, art and engineering, art and technology, send us a voice note to podcast at theartian.com and we will make sure to have you on our show. Today's guest, Natalie Mibach, works at the intersection of art, science, and data. She works with data in a creative ways you cannot expect. At times, she translates data into beautiful physical objects. At times, she translates it into musical scores. In an era when data is so important, she encourages us to be more adventurous with data. She shows us that data can be much more engaging and impactful if we approach it differently. Hey, Natalie. Welcome to the Artian Podcast. Hi, I'm so glad to be here. Natalie, can you introduce yourself briefly to our listeners? Sure. I am Natalie Mibach. I'm a sculptor who has been translating scientific data into woven sculptures and musical scores for nearly 18 years. And uh, I live in Boston and I am a full-time artist. I'm super excited about today's episode because your work is fascinating and I want to ask you, what attracts you to the world of art? Because you work at the intersection of art and science, and I'm interested, why art? Yeah, so my journey to art really came later in life. I definitely um, had uh, other adventures beforehand. I actually graduated in political science, uh, studied, studied Chinese for many years, and it was only later in life that I came to the arts. And I became an artist, particularly a sculptor, because of my interest in science. So when I started to get really interested in science, I needed some sort of tactile, physical way of studying the science, understanding the science, and making objects that would help me understand it, get a three-dimensional understanding of what I was studying. So I became an artist when I started to focus more specifically on science. And that was when I was in my 30s. You actually need to kind of understand science and you do it through the work of art. But you also had the option to actually choose to study science, but still you study art. And one of the things you mentioned is that you see art as a language of thought. What is your take on that? Yeah, so I think I always thought of art as foremost being a language of thought, a language of problem solving. And I never really think of it as making objects. I always think of all the sculptures that are in my studios as these artifacts of thoughts. When you have an idea, you build an object and then the idea evolves and you build the next object. So I always thought of art and art making as a way of thinking something through. And I've always also loved the freedom of art. And I'm not so interested in studying science through the lens of science. I'm interested in studying science through the lens of art because I get to break rules 
that scientists don't get to do. And I am interested in, you know, if I have the freedom to approach a scientific uh, study in a way that a scientist cannot do, you know, does this approach of art, does it bring in a fresh perspective on the science that, that we are studying? And I've always felt more comfortable in being able to investigate something through a tactile medium and through the artistic lens. And how did you do this? When was it maybe the question that you did the move from political science, what you graduated from, into the world of art? Yeah, it's such a strange thing. You know, I, I teach college and I have a lot of first year students who are just so terrified about, am I making the right decision and studying, you know, political science versus art versus history? And I'm always like, oh my gosh, you don't know where life will lead you. I got interested in art really through my interest in political science. So after I graduated, I ended up living in Indonesia for two years. And this was 96 to 98. And at the time, there was a the Suharto regime that was starting to fall apart. And so there was a lot of political upheaval in the country. And it was the artists, particularly contemporary, the artists who were focusing on contemporary art that were very vocal. And so I started to hang out a lot with artists to understand what they were thinking about the regime, how they were expressing themselves. And by just spending time with them and seeing how they were using this language of artistic expression as a way of not just expressing their opinion, but processing and thinking about what and envisioning what a new country might look like, really kind of opened my eye of uh, to the possibilities of art. And it was that that led me to want to investigate further what I can do, it, you know, how can I study art further? Because I was intrigued by this sort of intellectual aspect of it. And I went back to the United States and getting a degree in art education because it seemed very natural, this idea of art as a method of thinking and learning. So they were all very closely connected. So after art education and after getting a degree there, I realized that I really didn't know anything about what it means to be an artist. And so after spending several years in art education and being a teacher, I really wanted to first understand, well, what does it mean to be a practicing artist in the society to give what I was teaching in the classroom some sort of context? So I went back to get an MFA in sculpture, and that's really when the signs kind of started to come in. And the science, again, was also a very ser serendipitous m moment. I was finishing my focus on art education. I was writing my thesis on art education, which was this thesis on the study of time and how you can use art to study time and how time is seen differently in different disciplines. So how does history look at time versus music versus dance? creating this curriculum that was building artistic projects that would allow you to investigate these different notions of time. And I think it was that that led me to start taking science classes. And so I started taking science classes uh, at Harvard University in their night school division. And it just happened to be that down the hall or down the street, excuse me, uh, was a an art center that was teaching basket weaving skills. And so those two classes, I took basket weaving in the afternoon and then in the evening was my astrophysics class at Harvard. And so I just found myself going into the classroom with my sprayer, with my reed, with my bucket, after having just learned how to make a basket and then listening to these incredible lectures of space and time. And I thought, oh my goodness, how can I dig into this beauty, into this incredible science? And what I find so interesting about the human mind is we're, we're very limited. And so when we are trying to problem solve, we reach out to what we have immediately around us. And it happened to be the basket weaving. And so when it came to writing a final paper for this, this astronomy class, I ended up weaving a basket because I wanted some sort of tactile way of, of digging into that science. So wait, just to make sure I understood, you use your basket weaving in your Harvard astrophysics class. Yes, I okay. did. So I always tell people it takes one teacher to believe in your unconventional way of learning to sometimes really open the doors up. And this was Professor Chason at Harvard University. And one of the things that he did early on in the class was he would bring in art pieces. Uh, oh, really? There were paintings. Yeah, there were paintings that his wife had done about astronomy. 
He would bring in artistic renditions of scientific concepts that, that we were studying that were related. So he brought art into the classroom early on. And so that sort of gave me the sense of, well, well if, if, he's, if he's dragging in a painting into an astronomy classroom at Harvard University, I think he might be open to me weaving a basket. So It's I mean, a final project. Yeah. The first basket that I wove was actually based on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which is this beautiful diagram in astronomy that looks at two values, uh, the luminosity and the overall energy output of a star. And based on these two values, you can determine the evolutionary stage of every star, whether the star is dying, whether the star is middle age or young. And there is such a simplicity in that diagram and such beauty. And I thought, gosh, if I can just translate that diagram into a tactile form, maybe I can understand it better. So I used that diagram uh, for my final paper. And rather than writing about it, I translated that diagram into a three-dimensional form. And this three-dimensional form was big. So it was like three feet in diameter. So which is like, I don't know, like a meter in diameter in both directions. I came and I handed in the sculpture on the day that the paper was done. And he did not blink an eye. He accepted it. And that, really? You know, yeah. And that, that sort of opened the door up. And then from then on, I thought, well, okay, so how can I use the basket weaving, not just as a way of making 3D versions of a graph, but how can I now use the grid of the basket to actually translate information that relates to astronomy? So this And, is actually the moment when you start to converge sculpture with data? Yes, exactly. So one of the fascinating things about space is that You know, you're dealing with the deepest of space and time, and yet all we have from astronomy are images that are either projected through a computer screen or back in those days, we actually had a slide projector and it was projected against a wall. There's a flatness to astronomy. That's really frustrating as a tactile learner. You can't touch a star. You can't even really wrap your head around the enormity of some of those numbers that are, that are thrown at you with the science. And So I spent a lot of time doing two things. Uh, first, focusing on just the part of astronomy that I could observe here on Earth. So I focused a lot on the sun and the moon and looking at those cycles and using those data sets to translate into woven sculptures. And then also spending a lot of time looking at middle school lesson plans and seeing how do middle school teachers explain these concepts. How do they explain light? How do they explain distance? How do they explain time within the context of, of that science? I want to ask you a question. Why did you look at school teachers, how they teach science? Um, I looked particularly at middle school because they have to take pretty complicated concepts and try to make them into something that can be digested in oftentimes 45 minutes or less, because you have a short class here, especially in, in the United States, class times tend to be shorter. But also middle school lessons tend to, be, tend to involve some sort of tactile project. Working so with your this, hand. Yeah, working with your hands or making something, you know, or, or even just, uh, not, not just middle school, you can even go back to K through five, making something tangible or even putting relations like uh, distance relationships into something that can be demonstrated through you know a baseball and, a, and an orange that's so and so many feet away and then way down there is that ping pong ball and that's that's the other planet so making something relatable to our own scale on earth i guess so it's kind of bring me to the next question because for the people that haven't seen your work yet and Natalie now is talking to me from her studio and the background is full of beautiful a sculpture made of, out of reed and their representation or translation of the weather. That's my question for you, Natalie, is that you moved from the lunar calendar and astronomy into dealing and representing weather. And I'm interested why you chose weather. Yeah, so that's what happened after graduate school. And up to then, I had always been working with data that other people had collected. And so I accessed the data through the internet mainly. And data and sculpture have always been, to me, intertwined because they 
emerged, when I started to identify myself as an artist, those two were always right there. And it's still that way. I think of data and of sculpture or of reed or of paper, whatever material I'm using, as being equals. They're material that I'm using to understand something. And I focused on weather because I was curious to see how would my understanding of sculpture change if I am the one who's actually collecting the data myself? How would it change my understanding of data and how would it change my understanding of sculpture? So when I found myself living on uh, Cape Cod, which is this beautiful peninsula in southeast Massachusetts, I found myself living in Provincetown, a small town that is surrounded by ocean. And so this was sort of a perfect opportunity to go out and observe the weather. Every day I could go out to the beach and just collect information. I was there for two years and those two years were very humbling years. I learned a lot about data collecting and how difficult it is and how disciplined you have to be and how much you learn about data through the collecting process. And so for 18 months, um, because the residency was always during the winter months, I would go to the same beach over and over again, Heron Cove Beach, and I would go there with uh, very simple data collecting devices I would get from the hardware store. So a thermometer, a compass, um, I had a little wind reader, I had a pressure reader, and of course my journal. And I would go out there every day to the beach and sit down and collect data from a very specific place on the beach. And then while my instruments were collecting information, temperature, you know, wind readings, pressure, I would also just spend time writing down in my journal what I was observing. So what was washing up on shore? What sort of plant material? What sort of ducks were flying, you know, were uh, swimming in the water or were hanging out on the beach? What was the color of the water? What sort of boats were out Beautiful. in the water? What was the sound like? All these things, all these observations that seemed descriptive and sort of, okay, well, I'm just doing this because I'm waiting for my instruments actually were very, very important to give the numbers that I was collecting context. And it was also, so there was something that was coming out in this process that was, that made me realize the importance of slowness. There's something very slow about weather observing. You can't really understand weather through an app. Weather reveals itself slowly because weather is a, an interaction with an environment. And so you have this amalgam of systems that make, make up weather and they in interact with an amalgam of systems that make up the environment. And that interaction reveals itself very, very slowly over time. So there's a slowness in observing and understanding the data, just as, as there is a slowness in weaving this data. Weaving is very, very labor intensive. So these baskets that I'm building are very time consuming. So there was this really interesting link between the two. So weather became, in a sense, a very easy laboratory to start collecting data. It was very accessible. I can collect it myself. I can build my own data collecting devices. So the more I spent time on the beach, the more I saw things I could collect. It was like I was a scavenger. I was just you know, looking for things, constantly hoarding data in whatever, however way I could. And so I would build these um, box that I converted into a wave height reader, or I would make these different kind of wind readings, uh, wind, so wind kind of, reading devices. Kind of inventing your own tools? Yes, absolutely. So that, that's how I focused on weather. And I think also the more you spend time looking at something and the more you begin to understand, you, more the sort of complexity reveals itself. I think the more I became in awe of weather as a complex system, it just became very evident that there's so much more to weather than temperature, you know, pressure and, and wind readings. And the reason I stuck with weather is because over time, as the sort of complexity of, of these weather variables that make up weather became more and more evident to me, and mind you, I'm studying this not from a scientific perspective. I'm very self-taught at this point. I'm you know, taking some classes, I'm, I'm working with some scientists, but I'm not going to meteorology school at all. <laughs> this is definitely me learning on my own. Um, but I started to get more and more interested in how humans understand weather and how we respond to weather. What did you discover? Well, what's really interesting about humans is that we are very complex weather stations. We soak in a lot more information about the weather than we're actually aware of. So 
we are these walking weather stations just to begin with. We can sense temperature, we can sense humidity. We're not aware of it, but we make these minute adjustments all the time. Or even if you, you know, walk through a city, which is also a phenomenal place to study weather because cities themselves create weather patterns. And then when you're measuring weather in a city, are you measuring the weather? Are you measuring the city that's create, you know, the city that's changing or that's um, reconfiguring the weather phenomena? So, you know, just to walk through the city, you, you notice that there are some streets that are cooler or some streets that are warmer. There's more wind in some streets than others. So you begin to understand that the environment that you're walking through is actually affecting the weather itself. So on one hand, we're very sensitive to the weather in ways that I think we, we most of the time probably just, you know, don't, don't even realize. But I was also interested in how we respond to weather when it affects us emotionally. So weather comes to the foreground whenever something dramatic happens. You know, when I speak about my work, I always ask the audience, depending on their age, do you remember the weather on 9-11? And everyone will remember the weather on 9-11. No one will remember it the day before or the day after. So weather is this companion that's with us from the day we're born to the day we die. Sometimes it just really comes to the forefront and we remember it and we identify with a certain day. And then there's also this whole phenomenon of the way that we respond to climate change. We respond to weather events. Here in Massachusetts, we have a lot of problems with sea level rise, and yet houses still being built right at, at the uh, seashore. So I'm also interested in how humans respond to weather events that are linked to climate change. And we're not rational, and certainly not when a crisis hits. And I find that very interesting and also somewhat beautiful. I know that's maybe problematic, but we're, we, we pride ourselves so much in being logical thinkers, but when, but we're not. There's, and in that irrationality, I think is something very, very human. Natalie, before I ask you about the role of art in climate crisis, let's take a short break. Hi, listeners. It's clear that our speakers are at the intersection of art and innovation, but they didn't just arrive there casually. They developed their skills, gained knowledge, and more importantly, grew their artistic mindset. Would you like to develop some of these skills, capabilities, or a growth mindset? Then I would encourage you to check our art-based learning experiences. Whether you want to build your leadership skills or your innovation competencies, our training can be just what you are looking for. Visit us at www.theartian.com. That is T-H-E-A-R-T-I-A-N.com to learn more. Thanks again for coming back. I'm speaking with Natalie about weather, science, and art. Natalie, you started to talk about the, how humans are irrational or when it comes to weather, and we are very well aware of the climate crisis, at least some of us. And your pieces, I found them beautiful because some of them can take a whole room. Some of them can actually go... Just like you mentioned in one of your talks, just put them in a suitcase in the head compartments and traveling with them. And I wonder from your perspective, what do you think the role of art in communicating this climate crisis? There was an article that I read in 2014 by Zadie Smith called An Elegy for a Country Season. It's still reliably ablaze in Cornwall, if not at Carnival. And it's nice the Scots can take a little more heat with them. When they pack up and leave. And it was published in the New York Review of Books. And that essay was very instrumental in making me think about art as in connection to the climate crisis. And one of the things that she talked about was the weather and how the weather is changing and how we are witnessing weather patterns changing and how we are struggling in a sense to find ways to describe that. So, you know, as the spring gets warmer earlier or as the, as the temperatures are hotter in the summertime or we have more extreme storms in the, in the wintertime, all these subtle changes that we're observing, we're struggling to find a language for that. And what she was saying was that the weather is so connected to climate change, no one wants to talk about climate change because it's such a political subject, that the conversation about weather has been isolated between the scientific and the political Spheres. dialogue. And that is what is shutting people up. And instead, what we need is to find 
more poetic ways of talking about the weather, more artistic creative outlets that allow people to develop a language that can explain or maybe just express or try to articulate the things that are happening within their own environment. So I was very intrigued by this article because it was talking about nuance. And I think that's where art can be very helpful in not just explaining the climate crisis. I mean, there is certainly art that does that and it does it very well as a kind of scientific communicator or a communicator of policy or, or whatever, however you want to use art as a, as a way of explaining the climate crisis. But I think there's also room for art in just simply creating a space in which people can talk about the changes that are happening within their own community. So my work definitely changed in 2015 when I started to integrate not just data into my work, which has always been there, but also sculptural elements that were more metaphorical, um, or I started to make very large installations to, in a sense, immerse the viewer into the data, but also immerse the viewer into the story that I was talking about. So it was less about explaining something, but more about, in a sense, revealing the complexity of this scientific phenomena that we're looking at, which is climate change, but also the complex, the messiness of the human responses to it. And my point was not necessarily to convince people of climate change or to explain the weather, but really give people an opportunity to tell me about the weather, to talk about the weather, to explain these very difficult and very nuanced changes that were happening in their own environment. You mentioned the word nuance, and I want to take you to another aspect of your work. Because sometimes you take the data and make them sculptures. Sometimes you take the data and use musical chords and then create the sculpture. And I'm interested why you invite or bring music or musical chords into your work. What is the role of the music in that sense? Again, it has to do with nuance. So when looking at how humans respond to weather, I think you also have to take into account that we respond to weather emotionally. And I wanted to figure out a way of bringing in emotions into the translation of scientific data without changing the information. And so the very first musical score I wrote was about a death in the family. This was my father-in-law who died. And when this happened, I thought, how can I, is it possible for me to take scientific data and somehow translate it into a way that would still bring out the emotional roller coaster that we were all going through as, as he was dying, um, but still retain the, the information as information. So not change it around to make it sound sad or happy or anything like that. So that's how I turned to musical notation. And I thought of musical notation, and again, this, I'm coming at it from a sculptor's perspective. Uh, so I thought of musical notation as, uh, you know, you can have a, a very simple melody that you can make it sound sad or happy or erratic by simply changing the notation system around it. You're not actually changing the notes, you're just changing the system around it. And so you're making it sad, you know, you're making it a minor tone or a major tone and so forth. And I was interested in that. And so musical notation was a way of retaining the quality, the retaining the information without actually changing it, but infusing it with some sort of emotional uh, reading. So the first musical score I wrote was the death in a family, which is from the day he, from the day we found out about his death to the day he, of his funeral. And all the weather data comes from my weather station. So humidity, temperature, pressure. So that's all the objective data. But then infused in that is a tempo reading, which is a black kind of slashed line that shows what time actually felt like during this time of grieving. Because human beings are not, weather instruments are metronomes. They can measure things by the minute, by the second. Human beings don't experience time like that. So especially during a time of grief or, or stress, time slows down, time speeds up. You're, you're all over the place. So the tempo in that score was expressing that part of time when things felt like they were going really fast and other times when it was getting really slow. And, and then I took this, what I thought was a musical score because I don't play music and I can't read music. So this was written, you know, as best as I could do it. And I 
brought the score to Elaine Rambola, who is an incredible pianist who is very used to working with graphic scores. So uh, she looked at the score and was very honest in telling me what worked and what didn't work. And then I asked her to interpret the score, not to change the notes themselves, because I still wanted the score to be the weather, but to infuse the score with these emotional tempo readings that I was talking, that I was trying to bring in. And so that was sort of the beginning of what then became the Weather Score Project, a project that I started in uh, 2009, where I have been collaborating with musicians and composers all over the country, where I build musical scores based on scientific data or weather data. And then I give them the scores and they interpret the scores and sometimes write new pieces. I have a question, Natalie. Can we listen to these pieces? Yes. So there are, are two pieces that we can listen to. The first piece is Hurricane Noel. This was one of the first scores I wrote after the one on, about my father-in-law. And the more I worked with musicians, and I've always been very lucky to work with musicians who've been very honest to tell me what's wrong or works and what doesn't work. And so the more I worked with them, the more the, the graphic quality of these scores changed. So Hurricane Noel is a score that tracks the the passing of Hurricane Noel in New England, in Massachusetts. And um, it looks very much like a graph. So when you look at the score, you think this is not a musical score in the traditional sense, it just looks like a graph. And it, that's exactly what it is. It's, it takes temperature, uh, humidity and wind readings and simply transposes these three graphs onto a piano keyboard. So it's an incredible simple score. However, because it's a hurricane, you're having very, very high wind readings and very low pressure readings. The graphs basically um, go over six octaves. And so there aren't that many instruments besides the piano that have that kind of octave range. And so when I was working with musicians on interpreting the score, one of the first things that they have to work with is the fact that it, that it goes over six octaves. So how do they problem solve that sort of impossibility. So you can play it with a piano, but can you play with any other instruments? So a lot of times musicians will bring in other instruments. And the second thing they have to deal with is boredom, because if you just play the graph just as it is written on the, on the score, then woohoo, you know, I can have a computer do this. So how do, they, how do they bring in their own musical voice? How do they bring in their own aesthetics? How, how do they bring in the storm and what they think a storm sounds like? into the interpretation of the score while still retaining the integrity of the notes because the notes are data. So the first piece that you're gonna hear is a snippet of a piece by uh, the Axis Ensemble. You're gonna hear a cello, a, um, a violin, a viola, and a piano. And you'll hear a little snippet of that. So let's hear that right now. So that was the first piece, and then you kind of integrated it to other pieces. What is another example that you can give us? Yes. Yeah, so again, the purpose of working with the Weather Score Project and working with musicians was to allow other people into the process of working with data, because I'm interested in how do creative people who work in a very different discipline that I don't know much about, and in this case, music, how do they approach data as a material? How do they work with it? How do they still retain the integrity of data? And how do they infuse the data with, with a human story? And so the more I, I collaborated with musicians, the more this, the scores changed. And one of the things that I started to do more and more was rather than just creating a score that express, that translates data from a particular storm, I started to build scores that tell a specific story, a human story. And so the next segment you're going to hear is 
a score that I wrote about the perfect storm in 1991. And the perfect storm was a storm that consisted of two storm systems, um, Hurricane Grace down in, in the Bahamas and the tropical depression up in the north. And those two storm systems interacted together to create what meteorologists will ended up calling the perfect storm. It was sort of one of those storms that no one ever thought would actually take it happen. It was something that would happen in, in a computer model, but no one ever expected this to happen in, in real life. But it did. And so these, this, it created this monster storm. And the musical score is actually about a boat, the Andrea Gale, a fishing boat from Gloucester, Massachusetts, that was out in the Grand Banks and that sank during that storm. And Sebastian Junger wrote this wonderful book called The Perfect Storm that, that tells the story of this fishing vessel out in the waters and you know why they were out in the waters. It was the last fishing round and eventually they turned back too late and they sank somewhere near Sable Island. And so the score basically follows the, the, the path of the ship as it leaves Boston and then the night of the sinking. And then the third act, it's divided into three acts. The third act writes about the people in Gloucester waiting for their loved ones to come home. So it's all made out of weather data, but it's infused with this human story. Matthew Jackford looked at the score and it's a long score. And Matthew Jackford is a composer from West Virginia. And he was really interested in the intervals that the wind readings were doing or, or making in the score. And so he used those as the beginning point of his music. But then the interesting part about where the Andrea Gale sank, it sank somewhere near Sable Island. And it's a 40 kilometer long sand bank. Wild horses live there. There's a weather station there, but it's also a, an area that has that's known for shipwrecks. There's tons of shipwrecks. And fishing shanties oftentimes talk about shipwrecks uh, or gales that's that led to the sinking of a particular ship so he infused his interpretation of the wind reading with a fishing shanty that talks about a shipwreck that took place in that area so you have in a sense um, an oral history that is recording a shipwreck that happened in 1800s and then he's infusing it with the data coming from the weather station from sable island that's recording this current storm that the Andrea Gale sank in. So he combined those two. And so the you, you'll hear the, the wind, da 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 And then at some point you'll hear a violin coming in and that's the fishing shanty. Natalie, I have a question. You speak a lot about data, and I'm, I'm wondering, when do you think data becomes meaningful? Can you give us an example? Data is so poetic. I love data, and I love the beauty it kind of hides within. And I think it becomes meaningful to me, in a sense. It becomes meaningful to me when it becomes beautiful. I think it's beautiful when it can connect to some sort of human experience, when it can create some sort of empathy with a reader, some sort of personal collection, a connection to with the with the reader or or the or the viewer or the listener. Data itself, I think, is meaningless. It's the stories that you tell around data that reveal what what it's connected to or what it's what it is. And so I've always been very interested in data visualizations that don't just throw at you data points, you know, in a visually interesting way, but that also connected to the human experience that they are connected with. An example of a really wonderful visualization that I came across that inspired one of my pieces that I did on Hurricane Harvey was a data visualization I found in the New York Times shortly after Hurricane Harvey that uh, was a map of um, Houston. And so it had the Houston area and then the some of the coastline and then the Beaumont, which is another city to the east of Houston. And Hurricane Harvey hit the Texas coast by first going inland over Houston and sort of hovering over Houston for several days and then going back out into the ocean and then going back inland towards the Beaumont area. So it did the sort of inland back out to the ocean and then back inland towards Beaumont. And what this map shows is the Twitter messages that were sent during that time frame, so it's about a week. And it showed where the Twitter messages were sent, but also what the message contained. 
And people were reaching for Twitter because the 911 system was falling apart. So people were turning towards that. And so you see these dots popping up in different segments, first in the Houston area, and then slowly it dies down because the storm is back out of the ocean, then it picks up in the Beaumont area. But these Twitter messages are just heart-wrenching. They're, you know, out of baby formula, stuck on the roof, no food. My dad's been missing two days. Uh, these, are, these are phrases of fear, of, of alarm, of, you know, these are SOSs. And I loved the combination of this very analytical way of showing where the information came from, but then also what it contained because it was, gave us such a window into what the human experience really was like during that time. We are getting into the end of our podcast. One of the questions I want to ask you is that, what do you think about this era that we are living? Everyone is so obsessed with data and we hear about the big data and collect data and, and let's analyze the data. And, and what I feel is that we collect, 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 collect the data, but not necessarily doing something with it. On a personal level, I always say that it's not about the data. It's what you do with the data that I think is important. And I'm interested, what is your perspective as someone that works with data? For me, it, it comes back down to making a meaningful, or building a meaningful story with data, making some sort of connection to somebody and making that data that you're working with relevant. And one of the things that I find with data is that we impose a lot of expectations on how data should function and what it should tell us. We want data to tell the truth. And so I feel like there's a lot of data visualizations that are always approaching data in the same way. And it's interesting to me because one of the contradictions that I walk into every day in the studio is this contradiction that on one hand, if I'm really ever going to understand a medium like reed or paper or wood or ceramics, I have to fail with it a hundred, a thousand times until I really understand what are the parameters of this medium that I'm working with. If I take that kind of language with data and I say, I'm going to fail with it a hundred, a thousand times, I'm going to break it, twist it, sit on it, melt it. I'm going to snip it up. I'm going to smash it. Immediately, you know, it, data becomes impure and therefore no longer data. It's now become something else. But I think we're not failing enough with data and the way that we're working with data enough to really understand what else it can tell us. If we always approach data in this very analytical way, in this, you know, infographic way of consuming data, I'm not sure if we're really learning more about the data itself. And I'm also wondering if we're not creating an expectation of how data should be consumed. You know, one of the things that always strikes me um, is when I show my work, sometimes I'll actually put the data right next to it. And the data is in, in you know, spreadsheets and graphs. And what I'm interested in is what version, the sculptural version or the, the graphic version, what version does the viewer believe in more? And why are we so conditioned to trust data that comes to us with the form of a graph? We're more hesitant to trust data that comes through us through a sculptural translation because now you know we, we're, we're so conditioned to approach data in a certain way that I think sometimes we're, we're missing the, what else we can do or what, we're missing what else it can tell us if we're constantly approaching it through, through the same way which brings me back to Zadie Smith and her call to artists and, and creatives to really rethink and how we talk about the weather can't always talk about whether through the lens of science and politics to truly understand the human experience of it. Yeah, I think it's you raise such an interesting question. Why people prefer the graph over the sculpture as an explanation of or translation of the data. And Natalie, now you recently, during the pandemic, you kind of took the leap. You started your own uh, venture, joined the business incubator, and now you are selling your beautiful artifacts. Tell us a bit about your experience now in the entrepreneurial world, working with young entrepreneurs, how does it come up? Oh, it's it's really wonderful. It's the best decision I, I took, actually, uh, since the pandemic. So I, I joined a business incubator uh, with 29 other students, and I started a company called Spiders and Birds, and we make uh, woven, playful design lighting for the home that likes to smile. 
and it is infusing the playful aesthetics of my work with uh, functional objects. And one of the things I love about being in this business incubator is that even though I have an almost 20 year career as an artist and having run my own studio as an artist and having, you know, and I'm full time, meaning I live off what I make in, in, in the studio, starting a business is very, it's similar, but it's also very different. And in many ways, I'm learning how to problem solve in a new way. It feels both familiar and both unfamiliar. And it's, it's just, it's wonderful when you have an opportunity to relearn, to rediscover yourself as an artist, but in a very different um, context. So I'm, I'm, I'm really loving this right now. So what is your biggest uh, realization or understanding about the world of entrepreneurship and art? Both are about problem solving. You have to just problem solve and problem solve and problem solve. And it's, it isn't resolved with, with one solution. It's just a constantly reworking or reworking. And one of the things that I, I also know is that as a sculptor, I'm much better at fixing something that's right in front of me. So when I started this business, I launched very quickly because I wanted to be able to fix something that was already living So it's evolving, it's constantly changing as I'm, how it sits in the business world and, and how customers are interacting with it. And, and it's exciting. It's like a new sculpture I'm building. We will definitely add the, the links to everything you mentioned on our website. Natalie, I want to ask you a last question. You take playfulness and toys very seriously. And your sculptures in many ways look like a beautiful toy. But in the past, you said, that your work aimed at the adults because children understand it profoundly. Why children understand it profoundly and we are the adults need the help? Because I think children uh, still have the ability to delve into imaginary play. They, they are very in inhibited in approaching an object and looking at this object as being a story, as telling us something and infusing this object with imaginary characteristics and qualities. And so my work is very playful. Uh, so when you walk into my studio, or maybe you can, if you see the video, you'll see some of the playfulness in the background. People oftentimes think it's, it's a toy store and that's very deliberate. I'm making these objects look very playful because the first thing I, I don't want you to first think about data when you see the work or science. I want you to just be sucked into these sculptures. And the first thing I want you to think about is play of toys and to kind of lure you into this complexity of information through the lens of play. And only after you spend some time looking at it, do you notice little tags, little numbers uh, that indicate temperature or wind, and you begin to understand that there's a numerical logic that's holding it together. And so that's one way that I use play. I think play is very, very difficult. I work so hard to create the conditions of play in my own studio practice. I have to work at it very, very hard because I think play requires you to not have an expectations of the outcome. You have to be open to things changing. And it's very hard to do when you're constantly being asked to, to produce this, 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 or people like this particular sculpture. Can you do like 15 more of those? You know, in order to keep the mind and the relations between sculpture and data fresh, I constantly have to reimpose or try to create these conditions of play. Play has two qualities I love. One of them is it has limits. It has parameters. A soccer game only functions because there are a set of rules and there, there is a field that, that is where those rules are being adhered to. And as soon as somebody breaks those rules, then you no longer are in the, in the context or, or in the framework of play. So having rules, is really helpful in finding where those parameters are. And for me, data, data create those rules. And my role as an artist is to constantly push where the parameters, where the perimeters are of that data in order to understand where, what the rules are. The second aspect of play I love is imaginary play, which is when you, you know, you invent things, some sort of imaginary play that kind of goes on and on and on. And I think 
imaginary play is really helpful in allowing outcomes to be unexpected. So those are two things that I think a lot about. In fact, in my studio, you can't see it, but in the back here, I have a phrase that I wrote down many years ago and, it's, and I wrote down, play is an elastic form of logic. I think play is logic. And play is also the mechanism that allows us to, to stretch and to find where is, where is the boundary of logic. And it's the boundary when it's logic and it starts to merge into the illogical where the magic happens for me. I think it's a great kind of message to finish our podcast. Play with the boundaries and activate your imagination. And we can definitely learn from kids. Natalie. Thank you very, very much. Oh, thanks so much for having me. We are producing our podcast without any ads, and we are relaying on our community's direct support. People like you, our listeners. So if you find it valuable, I will be super grateful if you could spread the word by leaving a rating and maybe a review. It will take you just 30 seconds to do so. And it is very helpful in getting these ideas to a wider audience. If you are interested to develop your artistic mindset, if you are looking to grow your business, if you want to develop the innovation competencies in your organizations, I will highly recommend you to check our workshops and trainings, all available on our website. The episode was mixed and mastered by Daniel Duran. You can subscribe to the Artian podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Our previous shows are available on our website, www.derteyan.com slash podcast. Each episode includes show notes, guest recommendations, videos, and other materials. We can also be found on our LinkedIn page, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can reach us directly via email at podcast at derteyan.com. So I will be waiting here for you in the next episode with me, Nir Hindi. Once again, thanks for listening.